Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, Kevin Curley. What's up, Kevin? Hi, Tom. Just, uh, just enjoying a nice uh, February day. It's 75 degrees and sunny. So. <laughs> yeah, the winter didn't last big, very big long. Big difference. Yeah, right. It's two weeks of negative temperatures and then sunny. Okay. So let's uh, let's set the agenda. We'll, we'll kick it off with uh, stock market biases, uh, which I'm excited to talk about. We'll spend some time on that. We'll jump into our central bank roundup. We just had the Fed speak uh, yesterday, and then we'll we'll go into some some market ideas and some outlook. So uh, let's kick it off with uh, stock market biases. Yeah, so this is a common one. We get questions. Well, not so many questions, but we have people who come in with a lot of bias when it comes to investing. And this is a commonly seen thing. It's done. Uh, Richard Thaler in his book talked about many of the investment biases that all of us are subject to. And so they did a study basically looking at psychology to say, what is it that we do in investing that is problematic? And the reason they say problematic is a bias, as they define it, is a rational assumption or belief it affects the ability to make a decision based on facts and evidence. So kind of your hunches, your gut feelings, um, other things like that. And it can be two types. One type is cognitive and the other is emotional. So some of the common ones, and we, I'm going to run through all of these, but let's talk about the biggest one. The first one is hurting. So being influenced by peers to follow trends. Um, yeah, that's, let's go that's that a one. big one. Yeah, and we saw a lot of that, especially in, in during COVID and people becoming day traders. And we won't mention the, the C word, but, uh, you know, <laughs> everyone everyone just following following the crowd. And that kind of goes to the whole FOMO, um, you know, the fear of missing out. Yeah, and that's how you get bubbles. Um, on the other side, uh, it goes down as well. So when you start to hear that the world's coming to an end, everything's about to fall off a cliff, we're in a recession all those type of things, it's easy to get caught up in the herd and start to participate in that. And it's important to ignore that. So a great example from our podcast is last year, the herd was saying that stocks were going to fall and they were going down. And if you ignored that, you had a very good year uh, as far as investments. This year, the herd is saying stocks are going to be up 10%. Everything's fine. There's not going to be a recession. Uh, I think it's another time where you have an opportunity to ignore the herd and say, don't be hit by recent trends. And I think the last few months are a great example what changed october 1st that suddenly the market started going up and interest rates started going down there wasn't something it just market mentality and the herd kind of fall with it yeah you know you look over the last 40 years and jp morgan put out a good good chart the last 40 years the average return in the s p was right around eight percent um the average return for the average investor was just over three percent barely barely beating inflation and it's because of all these biases and, and, and it's 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 tough to not want to jump ship when the market's selling off and and get in when it's when it, when it's going up and you know the old saying is you know buy low and, and, and sell high um there's there's a there's a bias you call regret reversion um and that's basically what that is is when you, you get into the market and it's bad stock or bad investment and you don't have a risk management process in place and, and you, you, you regret it. And what you end up doing is you just hold on to it and don't do anything. Um, so, you know, when you go into the market and you make investments, you have to have a plan and, and a risk strategy because if you let emotions and biases get involved, um, that's where you start losing out and losing returns. And it's, it's interesting. If you look at all these different biases when it comes, and there's a lot of them, we won't go through all of them, but you look at gambling biases, they're identical. They're almost the exact. <laughs> they're they're just named. They're just named yep. differently. The, one of my favorite ones is the self attribution self attribution bias, and what that is is that when you pick a good investment, it was all you. You had great knowledge. You, you, you picked it. It went up. And on the flip side, when you pick a bad investment, it goes down. Well, it was external factors. You know, the market sold off, or the Fed raised rates, or whatever it was, but it wasn't your fault. 
Um, and that's a typical gambler's fallacy as well. When they win a hand, it's because they know what they were doing. And when they lost, well, it wasn't their fault. And uh, it was because of the dealer or whomever it was. So uh, it's, yeah. it's interesting to see. And that's essentially what you're doing. If you're going to the market without a strategy, you're just doing just that. It's gambling. And yeah, there's I think a reason why these are so around. important. Oh, <laughs> no, I was going to say, you kind of talked around the way you described it, the endowment effect is part of that bias as well, which is that if you own it, uh, it's great. And it's great because you own it. But if you didn't own it, you might feel pretty neutral about it, right? And then the other one along that line is the confirmation bias. So what you were just saying is, I'm right, it went up, I'm gonna be right again next time. And that also can happen when you see something and you go, oh, I read an article, it also said that I'm right. Uh, whether it's about AI or robotics or anything else, you go, I keep seeing this. I know that I'm right. I know that I'm right. And you keep seeking out these things. And you don't realize that it's seeping into your mind that you're just are, you're just looking for things or you're just noticing the more. It's the kind of the, the old one. You get a blue car and then suddenly yeah. there's blue cars everywhere or you get a certain brand. And then you're like, man, I didn't realize how many other people had this car. That didn't change. You just suddenly became much more heightened to it. Yep. Yep. You're just self just self justifying um, your 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 idea and, and looking for and ignoring all the all the red flags. Um, you know, there's another thing called backyard bias, which is kind of similar where, you know, if yeah. you're in California and Silicon Valley, maybe you're going to be investing mostly in tech stocks because that's what you know. Mm -hmm. If you're in Houston, maybe in oil and gas. Oil and gas. I mean, you look at the amount <laughs> of Northeast, investors it's all here. Financials. I mean, you know, California as a whole, it's a lot of, um, you know, socially responsible investing. So you tend to tend to invest in what you what you know, and which is why most investors are overweight, heavily overweight domestic versus international stocks. So we see yeah, this right now with the Magnificent Seven, right? There's a familiarity <laughs> bias, which is, oh, I know these companies. I've heard of all these companies. I use these companies. They're the biggest and best companies. I have an Apple Watch. I have an Apple phone. I use Google all the time. I have Gmail. Like, and you go, oh, oh, Microsoft. Yeah, they make my computer. And you, so you think that because of that, uh, it makes it for a good investment. And I think that yep. that's one we definitely uh, have to deal with a lot of times because just because a company makes a great consumer product doesn't make it a great investment. Uh, and then on top of that, familiarity bias, I think, has a big edge towards large companies. And you might ignore uh, smaller companies. And the right, one I struggle right. with the most with clients of trying to tell them there's value outside of these borders is the home country bias. And it, it's kind of it, it's very tied in with familiarity bias, but home country bias. I think it's something like Americans, 90 percent don't have any international stocks or it's 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 just it don't do international. It's too dangerous, too risky. And there's some really great international companies as well as countries that you can invest in that are going to take good, thoughtful care of your money that have rule of law. Uh, and recently in the last year and a half have actually out been outperforming the United States. So there's a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, no, and you, you, you mentioned it on the front end. That was a good point. There's a reason why the market went up as much as it did in October. Nothing changed. Earnings didn't change. You know, um, valuations didn't change. It was just people, you know, chasing the the Santa Claus rally and it, and it ended up taking, taking effect. Um, but you want to do the opposite of what the herd's doing. So to your point, everyone's, now piling to the market, there was seven trillion dollars last year that was in money market funds. That's the most we've ever seen um, because everyone thought the market was going to crash. And you're making five, five and a half percent, and you missed out on a lot of return last year. And mm -hmm. those investors are getting back in now. And who knows what the year holds for us? I'm, I'm optimistic, but um, that's why the average investor has just over a three percent rate of return over the last forty years is because they don't, you don't have a strategy. You got to take the emotions out um, and you got to- Yeah, you, well, you're hitting on two minute. key ones, which I think look kind of be the last ones we talk about, which is overconfidence. So overestimating your skill and accuracy and loss aversion is the disliking losses more than liking gains. So that's the piling into money market. Oh, I know that it's about to fall apart. We're about to have a recession. I know this is to be true. And also if we do, we're going to lose a ton of money. So I'm just going to have it in a money market. I'm going to make my 5%. Um, and then I'll get in later. And I think what I've seen is people don't get back in. Um, now it can yeah. be, if you're new to investing and you're just getting started, you know, start with dipping your toe in the water, then get the foot, then kind of jump in. Uh, you don't have to take a windfall and just put it all in, you know, day one, but the textbooks would tell you that's probably the best move and has the best expected return over time. Yep. Um, what's the, uh, acronym H O D L hold on for dear life. 
Um, so, you know, <laughs> hoodlers, <laughs> hoodlers, the diamond hands, as they refer to on, on, on red and the opposite is paper hands when they, yeah, a lot of paper hands the market right itself, now. sells off, they, they, they want to get out. So I think the, the, the moral of the story here is to, to have a risk management process in place, have a strategy in place, or otherwise you are just gambling. Yeah. And the, the last piece is just the, the, the final one I would mention is just the disposition effect. So this is the tendency to sell investments that are doing well and hang on to losers. Uh, if something's working, it's okay to just let it roll. Let's let it keep going. And we deal with this with asset allocation is rebalancing is important from time to time. Uh, but you got to let these trends run and it can be helpful to cut your losses short and say, I was wrong. Time to move in. So having a margin of safety, having an emergency fund, having all those things that let you take on an appropriate amount of risk in markets can be tremendously helpful. And it also is helpful to just think about this psychologically and go, I know that part of investing is just waiting and waiting is difficult. Waiting, I have a kid's book you read, it's called waiting is not easy, <laughs> but yeah. it's worth it in the end if you can hold on. And unfortunately, a lot of investing is boring. It's not exciting, you know, diamond hands and trades and oh, look how high this is going today. It's look how much money we made by quietly investing a little bit of time over a long period of time. And we compounded those gains. And now we have a successful, comfortable retirement. It's not, yep. Oh, look, now I can buy a Ferrari. It's <laughs> no, it, you have to be, you, not have day to, trading. You, have, you have to be comfortable knowing that what you invest in today, you're not going to be rewarded right away. And it, and it takes mm -hmm. time and the process does work. And it's why we, why, why we invest in the market. So speaking of which, what is going on in the market? Let's jump over to our, uh, our central bank roundup. Shine those boots. It's time for Ooh, Central Bank Roundup. So Powell spoke yesterday. Um, not much, not much change. The market didn't like what he said towards the end with uh, him possibly, you know, putting a low percentage of uh, a March cut on the table. Um, but, you know, I don't think it was. I, th I thought he, he wasn't hawkish or dovish. Um, you know, there was a 50% chance of a cut going into his speech in March, um, and it's now down to 40%. I, you know, I think the market sold off for other reasons, like some of the big big name earnings. Um, big name companies had just weak earnings like Microsoft and Google. But um, I, I thought his speech was right, right, right on par. Yeah, well, to set the scene, uh, last week, the ECB, which is the European Central Bank, uh, they held rates steady um, despite falling inflation. Now, their inflation rates are a little higher than what we have. Um, and then yesterday, the Federal Reserve did the same thing of we're not doing anything. Now, he did mention that the taper uh, has continued with their quantitative tightening policy. So they have rolled off, I think it was like $1.4, $1.7 trillion, which is a tremendous amount of money. And it is a tightening process. Um, I think the most telling thing about what your comments were was in the press conference when people tried to hold him to different things of, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? He's very noncommittal. So if you thought that their reading was hawkish, you probably, to use our earlier segment, came in with a bias that it was going to be hawkish. And if you thought it was dovish, you probably came in with a bias that it was going to be dovish because he didn't say one way or another. He even asked at one point, like, why are you not committal to, you know, one thing or another? It's like, I like to keep my option open. I don't want to commit to something and have to do it next time. So you know, we're going to kind of wait and see. And I thought that was tremendously helpful. Uh, I thought it was funny on CNBC, Rick Santelli throughout the, uh, the conspiracy of, you know, if you believe the Fed independence, you know, this is an election year and this is uh, kind of talking a little bit rosy. And you had a lot of senators who've been writing letter, letters to the Fed chair saying, you need to cut rates. This is a problem. Um, you know, the economy is rolling over. And regardless of what you or I believe, um, the reality is, is the Fed is supposed to be independent of this um, meanwhile i mean there is a huge fiscal deficit so there is a lot yeah. of fiscal support for the economy yeah you know he's gonna get a ton of ton of political political pressure and he, and he already has you know he he didn't bend very much in in 2017 when he was hiking and trump was all over him um who knows what happens this year but you know looking at the dot plot i mean the market's pricing in five cuts between now and the end of the year or 125 basis points assuming they do a quarter quarter each time the market's pricing in four six these numbers are all lower um prior to yesterday's uh presser so they actually expectations went went down and again we, we say this all the time and i i believe in the market more than the fed's target so i, I think we're going to get there i think we'll see five cuts between now and the end of the year 
um, and this soft landing could be could be in the works. Yeah, the hardest take I have is just that the Federal Reserve says yesterday and has continued to say we're not in a recession and we're not heading towards a recession, but there is weakening in the economic growth. And meanwhile, I think that we're actually in a recession. I think if you look back starting in kind of November, late October, you saw the jobs numbers start to roll over uh, and you saw ISM manufacturing data, especially when you look at new orders, start to roll over. That was almost a year ago that that happened. So between those things, I mean, there's clearly economic weakness. I think that we're in a recession in six months. We'll look back and go, oh, hey, remember that stuff in the November to February? That was a recession. Now, I think the Fed is denying that. And I don't think this isn't some conspiracy. They have data that's more accurate, uh, probably. And they also have to kind of go slowly. Because if he came out yesterday and said, yeah, everything's not fine. We're about to be a recession. But he didn't cut rates massively. Uh, people would panic and we'd have major problems. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they've are they always been reactionary. I don't see them uh, not, not doing the same thing this time around. And it's always backward looking. So, who, you know, I don't know if we're going to if we're in a recession or not. Um, I'm kind of neutral on it right now. But, you know, there's some there's some cracks in the consumer balance sheet, like we talked about. You're starting to see delinquencies continue to rise um, on the loan side. Uh, but companies on the company side earnings this earnings season has been pretty pretty decent outside the big big tech names that drove the market the majority of the market last year um earnings don't look uh as bad so i think there's still there's still some still some tailwinds some positives out there and um who knows we could have just a very a very boring year and it, that's typically what happens in, in elections Wouldn't that be we great? haven't seen <laughs> We haven't seen we haven't seen much volatility. You don't have these crazy one percent, two percent swings that we saw the last couple of years. Um, you might just have a steady, easy go up until up until November. Um, but I think you're, you're starting to see some of the leaders shift from from the big big tech back into some of maybe the more cyclical names, and that might be a continued trend. And if rates do start to go down, I think you're going to see uh, some of these smaller mid cap companies. Uh, have have a run just because the you know the biggest line item that that they have are their fi- you know and their fixed costs are are loans and if if interest rates are going down that's going to directly impact uh, their bottom line so it'll be curious to see uh, see how this year plays out. Yeah, well, we saw 52 week highs peaked a couple months ago. Um, as you said, some of the weak earnings from some of the major companies are seeing a big decline in their stock price. I mean, Tesla is a great example. They've fallen a lot after they announced earnings. Uh, Alphabet, as well as Microsoft, were both down after earnings. So all the kind of major leaders for the past couple of years, uh, things that were in that magnificent seven, uh, are falling. Now, their price really high. I think coming into the uh, earnings quarter, they were 37 on average for their forward price to multiple. And, um, you know, that includes NVIDIA, that includes Meta, that includes Apple. Uh, so that's a really a high rate of expectation. So they really have to do really well. So you've heard the term price to perfection before. They have to report, you know, great revenue, great earnings, great, you know, buyback programs, all these things. And I think it's going to be a challenging year for specifically those. If you look from a, a regulatory standpoint, it's basically made clear you're not going to be allowed to buy anything. So M&A transactions are not going to be allowed from these major companies because they're so large. Uh, I would say if they can't, you know, if they're not going to do CapEx and invest in new manufacturing, things like that, you know, and they can't buy anything, uh, all they have left is to dividend or buy back shares. So I think it could be okay. And maybe that's how they get that price to earnings multiple back down as they buy so much for their own stock back. Um, but I don't know. I think it's going to be a really challenging time for, for equities over the next few months. Yeah, I, I think, you know, looking at bonds again, I think bonds might be kind of um, the dark horse this year. You know, if interest rates kind of stay where they're at or even go down, I don't see them going uh, much higher from here. Bonds should do really well. The the the, the yields are good. Um, they've had an awful three year run because of interest rates going up. You know these companies, all these companies are have clean balance sheets right now. So if defaults are at all time lows, which they are, we don't see a meaningful rise in defaults. I think you take off. You have limited limited risk on the default side. You, you have I get I think less interest rate risk. In fact, you have a tailwind if rates go down, and you're getting a nice coupon. So you could see some nice returns in bonds for the first time in three years this year. Yeah, I hope so. It's been a rough time in fixed income. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, we'll pick up next in a couple of weeks with uh, another topic, um, a couple of timely topics. Maybe we'll talk about the new tax revisions and possible tax code and some, uh, some ideas there. 
All right. Sounds good. Talk to you then, Tom. All right. See you, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.